Computers are fascinating machines. Advancements in computing and parallel exploration in the realms of cognitive science, psychology, and electronics has enabled us to do things we never thought we could. And sitting in our pockets is an encyclopedia of information and performing very complex tasks is only a swipe away these days. There are tasks computers can't perform, however, and probably never will. A computer cannot determine why Velasquez's Las Maninas is a beautiful painting. A computer could perhaps compose a very intricate musical piece, but it can never compose Moonlight Sonata. Computers also do not understand emotions, as we all know. They do not understand moral conflicts. Such human processes are beyond computation. Gordon Moore, Intel's co-founder, had said in what is known as the so-called Moore's Law that computer processor speeds will double every 18 months. And interestingly, it has held thus far, but is predicted to break down as computer power is unable to maintain its rapid exponential rise with the standard silicon technology. So what happens in the next era of computing, we make better, faster, and cheaper computers and all of our problems will perish. Not quite so. The idea that any problem can be solved with fast enough and smart enough computers is pretty absurd. What's keeping us from achieving disease-free societies, better human-computer interfacing, next pharmaceutical revolution and space travel is just the inability to manufacture smart enough computers, which we, the humans, eventually succeed in manufacturing. This is rather disrespectful to our own species as we tell computers to do what we want it to do. And if there are problems that us human beings cannot solve with our organic human brains, then the computers can't solve them either. No, no. See, these problems are not the problems that computers can't solve because of processing speeds or any technological limitations, but the problems which the computers can never solve. Imagine you're looking for your favorite pair of blue socks because you want to wear them to the Intergalactic Olympics mentioned in part four. And your good friend Zozo the alien has won bronze medal in three-legged race. But the inevitable happens. You're able to only find one sock and can't find the other one. What you do at this point is what any sane, sentient being would do. Swear and hurl epithets at just about everything and then start sifting through and searching through the whole damn drawer until you find it. That's given that your sock is still not lurking around somewhere in your washing machine and that you can never know beforehand. So essentially your search comprises of the number of operations or comparison equal to the total number of sock items in the drawer. What if you had your socks ordered by colors and were distributed to different drawers? Yes, as if you're that organized and a weirdo. That way, you would not bother about the drawers labeled as red socks or the yellow ones. That saves you time. Now, all variations and complexities ignored, this is essentially how computers solved most problems and inspired to solve all problems. Now imagine further that you have found the socks and now you're ready to go. But you also happen to be an interplanetary Uber captain. So you must first visit X number of planets in your galaxy and come back to your own planet before you could go to Zozo's medal distribution ceremony. Obviously you would like to find a way where you can accomplish your captain's duties in, in the shortest amount of time. So if the number of planets you need to visit is less, it's not so much of a problem. But as the number grows, to be able to find the shortest path becomes exponentially difficult and eventually approaches virtual impossibility. Let us quickly analyze the following scenario. If you have three planets to visit and come back to your own, which is the fourth planet, you have the following possibilities. Not a problem here. If you know the distance between the planets, you can deduce the shortest path very easily. What if you migrated to Andromeda, to a new solar system, and have to visit 30 planets instead of 3? Surely, I mean, no calculation is impossible for computers, so you should be able to find that solution in a jiffy, right? Congratulations, that is incorrect. In order to find the shortest path between 30 planets, there are different possibilities. 
even if you knew the distance between the 30 planets and your computer could perform 1 million calculations per second, it will take number of years to find the solution. Now, that's a very big number. That's a huge number. That's a shockingly huge number. Now with our SOC situation, we were able to solve the problem if we could first sort our items and then apply some kind of a searching procedure. If we were then to have a million items to look through, we could still be able to find our SOC. No amount of sorting or searching could help us in the interplanetary Uber captain problem though. This is known as the traveling salesman problem, by the way, in case you want to Google further. We just cannot find the solution without having to first try all the paths. And that, as we have analyzed, is just impossible as the input size grows. See, what if an oracle appeared into existence out of nowhere and claimed to have the solution to the problem and he knows the shortest path between all the 30 planets and blurts out a number? The oracle also embellishes his claim with a fact. He tells us that he knows the distance between all the cities to be, say, this number, which he makes with one of his secret mental abilities to reach the conclusion. Would we have any way to verify if he's telling the truth or lying? We simply would not. If we could know if the hypothetical spectral oracle was telling the truth or lying about the shortest path in a reasonable amount of time, then we could also find the solution ourselves, which we have already seen that we cannot. But could we verify his claim that the distance between all the 30 planets is indeed this big number? That we can definitely do by simply adding the distances and seeing if the answer matches. This is called P versus NP problem, and it asks whether every problem whose solution can be quickly verified can also be quickly solved. See, P or polynomial time problems are the problems which we can solve and not worry about how the solution scales based on the input size. These include problems similar to finding a pair of socks in a drawer and problems of multiplication and sorting and so forth. NP or non-polynomial time problems are the problems similar to the traveling salesman problem where the complexity of solving the problem increases exponentially as the input size grows. Furthermore, if the solution of NP problems is verifiable quickly, it is called NP complete. And if it cannot be verified because it takes forever, then it is called NP hard problems. If we can find a way for problems which we can verify the solution for quickly can also be solved quickly, we shall be marching into the next phase of technological revolution, a new paradigm, an era where we could have cure for cancer, predict genetic mutations and and so forth. Also as a downside, there will no longer be any cryptocurrency or encryption as we know it, because these are all NP problems. This is why it is almost impossible to crack an encrypted password, but can immediately and instantly be verified if it's correct or not. Oh, and you can make a million dollars too if you can solve whether P equals NP. That is both a set of problems fall into the same category or not. That way, we would know definitively that we shouldn't look for a quick way to solve a hard problem because it just doesn't exist. No jokes. Clay Mathematics Institute in the United States is offering $1 million prize money for solving this problem. It's apparently a big deal. Grigory Prelinman, a Russian dude who solved another one of these Clay Mathematics Millennium Prize problems won a million dollar back in 2002 by providing the solution to what is known as the Poincaré's conjecture or Poincaré conjecture. He also was awarded the Fields Medal in Mathematics for his proof, which is like the Nobel Prize but in math or Oscar for weirdos. He declined both by stating, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in money or fame. I don't want to be on display like an animal in a zoo. Yeah, Mother Russia. No computer is fast enough to solve the conundrum of P versus NP problems. No matter how many processors work in parallel, they won't be able to help us. Even with quantum computing, with their super positioning algorithms, we'll not be able to bring this number down. So that's that. And also solving P versus NP problem is an NP problem. Let us imagine for a second that we do reach a point where 
the Bureau of Technology reaches unprecedented and unimaginable advancements and the definition of reasonable time changes and shrinks, would there still be problems that computers can never, ever solve? Alan Turing, one of the key figures in the development of theoretical computer science and computing in general, used the concept of self-reference and proof by contradiction to demonstrate how a computer can never be able to solve what is known as the infamous halting problem. What is the halting problem? It asks if it is possible to write a program that determines whether another program halts or runs forever. Well, very simple, right? When one of your operating systems gives you one of those darn dialogues saying not responding and you hope that it will start responding somehow soon because you're 99% done copying your files and sometimes it does resume and at other times it doesn't. What's going on there? The OS itself doesn't know whether it will resume normal operation or it won't. It is as clueless as you are. So why can't the programmers just write a simple program to catch when the computer runs into this issue and prevents it? Let us again bring our questionable oracle back, but only on Alan Turing's request. Turing urges us to believe that there does exist such a program which can be fed another program and some input and it will communicate with this very knowledgeable oracle and churn out a yes if the provided program will halt and no if it won't. Let's call this program Halt of Darkness. If our program Halt of Darkness outputs a yes, that is the provided program will halt, then we tell it not to halt. And if it says the program will not halt, then we tell it to halt. So great that this way we can ensure we don't run into the halting problem. Yeah, but not so fast. Remember the liar paradox from part one. This sentence is false. If it's false, then it's true. And if it's true, then it has to be false. What if we provide halt of darkness to halt of darkness as an input? So if the program halt of darkness is going to halt, we simply tell it not to halt. But halt of darkness is designed to do the opposite. So it will halt when it's not supposed to, and it won't when it is. So like the serpent that tries to eat its own tail, Turing conjured up a self-referential paradox. To resolve this contradiction, we're forced to conclude that such a program cannot exist. Just like we saw in part one, that the town with a single barber cannot exist. This very conclusion has far-reaching consequences. There are many, many questions for which computers can't reliably provide the right answers, and many, many happen to be of the same nature as the halting problem. Identifying viruses is one. A computer can never identify if a running program contains a virus or any vulnerabilities. Similarly, a computer can never tell if two programs do the same thing. Are we ever satisfied with our machines? Can we be able to appropriately and satisfactorily define what intelligence is so that when we come across it, we could pinpoint artificial intelligence and we know what it looks like? Computers are always lacking that one thing which just doesn't make them intelligent enough. John Searle's 1980 thought experiment, referred to as the Chinese room argument, has become rather important over the years due to the advancement in the so-called artificial intelligence. He imagines himself alone in a room following a computer program for responding to the Chinese characters slipped under the door. Searle understands nothing of Chinese and yet by following the programs for manipulating symbols and numerals just as computer does, he sends appropriate strings of Chinese characters back out under the door which leads those outside to mistakenly suppose there is a Chinese speaker in the room. So the question arises, making use of mere syntactic rules and symbol manipulation can be regarded as intelligence or not. The argument refutes that human minds are merely computer-like information processors. Instead, our intelligence is born out of emergent processes which are organic and our consciousness happens to be at the heart of it. We don't, however, know exactly what is consciousness to begin with. It seems the ability to self-reference and not run into contradictions is something which makes human beings superior to machines. Otherwise, nobody would have thought they could beat us in chess. Well, they can now. Perhaps in 30 years time, they will be beating us in tennis also. Our definition of intelligence is only a small fraction of our own limitations. Our inability to define what man is 
is perhaps much more important.